Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f*** up. <laughs> You're listening to Believe You Me with Michael the Count Bisbing. You know my name yet? And Anthony Lionheart Smith. Are we recording? We are recording. We are. We are. Look at this. The boys are back. And you are back in, where in the world are you? Denver. Yep, I'm back in Denver. Training. Grinding. Grinding. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Embracing the grind? Yeah. I'm in a weird place. A really good weird place. I'm, normally it takes me a while to get like in the groove of it. I hate it. I'm, I just hate the schedule and the grind. It takes me a couple of weeks to get in the grind. And I, I've been really excited about this one. You know, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not dreading the travel here. I'm not dreading the practices. My body feels pretty good too. Like I'm not nearly as banged up. Um, I feel good. I'm like, I'm having a good time in the gym. I don't know what the difference is, but I'm having fun. You said it's weird. Denver's weird. You've got one headphone in. That's yeah. weird. Have you got a cauliflower a cauliflower ear scenario going on right now? Uh, a little bit. I always only have one headphone in, though. Oh, do you really? Oh, it's, 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 it's the Anthony Smith style. Yeah, I'm too cool for two. It's like, Bro, do, you oh, doubles, do, you doubles, you do you double strap your backpack or you one strap? I'm a double strapper all day. Yeah, I am too. One headphone, one, two straps. One strap. Because listen, when I was at school, I was one strapping, of course. <laughs> but one strap falls off the whole time. You're always like giving it the extra little off. thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Two straps, you're nice and secure. Speaking of security, talk to me about this fight, Anthony. We talked about it last week when you weren't on here. Vito Petrino, undefeated. Mm-hmm. He called you out to your face, threw down the gauntlet, looked you in the eye. What was the thought process when he said that? Um... Yeah, well, okay, I have to address part of this, actually, because I did say at some point, I think I was on uh, Sirius XM, and... Jeez, they get the exclusives. And, well, no, it's, it's the only thing I said. I was just <laughs> really was like, well, I said I'm not, I don't, I'm not the new Neil Magny. Like, I'm not the 205 version of Neil Magny. I and when that. I said it, I don't think that I, like, clarified what I meant by that. So then I get a text message last week from Neil quote from like MMA junkie or something. He was like, Hey, what, why am I catching strays over here? <laughs> like, Don't win a fight, Neil. I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. I'm joking, right. Neil. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I was like, Oh my God, I felt bad because I was going off about the Petrino thing, but not meaning to offend Neil. What I meant was is every young guy that fights wants to beat up Neil Magny. Like every single one of them, every young guy who's got three or four fights in the UFC gets a couple wins. First name out of their mouth is Neil Magny every single time. Part of it's because Neil's willing to give those opportunities and chances. And, you know, he's had mixed success with, with those guys. But what I meant by that is I'm not the, the, the wounded lion that everyone, that, that these young guys are seeing. I'm not. I've had some ups and some downs and I've been in some weird places. And, but I've always, I have never lost anybody that sucks. And I've never, like, I'm not that guy. I'm just not. And I'm, and I'm not nice like Neil is, where, mm-hmm. Neil's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's just good opportunities. Let's go in there and fight. Let's have some fun. Like, I take that shit personally. And Neil doesn't, you know, he just, I think he likes it a little bit for the motivation, but he doesn't take it personally, but I do. And I think it's because I know that they're looking at me like I'm, like I'm cashed. Like I'm the wounded lion. I'm on my way out. Let's get it. Let's see if we can make a name off of him before he's completely done. And that's it. And for all them idiots on in the comments, like I'm allowed to be offended by that. I'm allowed to be upset by that. I'm a goddamn professional athlete. I've been doing this shit for almost 20 years. You think I got here because I don't take shit personally? It's exactly how mm-hmm. I got here. So, um, and that's how I feel about it. Like, he's probably a nice guy, but he looked, I mean, it'd be like if anyone walked into someone's job and then started telling everyone at your work that they do a better job than you or that, oh, I take that guy's job really fast. That's how I felt, you know? So imagine if you're, you know, for people at home, if you're and you're just sitting on your couch right now and some dude comes into your work and starts telling everyone that he's going to take your job, that would piss you off. And that's how I feel. So he's probably a nice guy. Personally, I don't have an issue with him, but um, I I think he's, uh, he's, he's powerful. He's big and strong. He looks like a million bucks. Um, I think he's a little bit low output, not a great, he's not a great grappler. He's not a great wrestler. He's got crazy power in his hands. Um, mostly a counter striker for the most part. He does some kicks here and there, but he's fairly, he's basic. He's basic. Doesn't mean he's easy, but it's, but it's basic. 
Well, a wounded lion is still a lion, Anthony. Still right. the king of the jungle. Do you know what right. I mean? Um, and I do know how you feel when people are trying to take your job constantly. All you up and coming wannabe would be commentators, kiss my ass. Okay, you that's talking to you, Michael Tiesa. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to all of you. I will fight you. I'm, I'm I never still a say lion that. as well. I never say that ever. I've never because I always feel like if I'm going to go out there and start pining to get an opportunity, and I'm begging for it, and every every interview I do, I talk about it. I always feel like. I'm going to offend you or DC or Dominic or Felder. And I hang out with you guys and I like you guys a lot. So like me saying that is essentially being like, I want that guy's job. When I make enough mistakes to get fired, you're welcome to my job, <laughs> <laughs> which hopefully never comes. We'll I just see. always figure at some point in time, someone will go off and do something else. There'll be another opportunity. There'll be more opportunities yeah. available. Maybe the fights will, we'll do more fights every year. There'll be less, I don't know. I can't imagine you and DC are going to be traveling all these huge, inter- like oh, these long oh, international fights too oh, many more years. I'm flying, baby. I'm, I, I like oh, you're that. going. I'm, yeah, I'm doing I'm them going, all. I'm going everywhere. I've never seen a pound note. I don't want to pick up. Okay. <laughs> so shut up. I'm from the north of England. While this cash yeah. to be earned, I'm earning it. Okay. Well, uh, I, see anyway. DC, I see DC not, not doing those too long. Hey, you know what? Speaking of that, he was commentating the NCAAs at the weekend. I did. I did. On, uh, on ESPN. And and um, I, I turned it on for a little bit because I text Callum, my son, obviously he was a wrestler, still is, loves it. Uh, he said, yeah, I'm just watching. I said, are you watching the fights? He said, no, I'm watching the wrestling, actually. DC's commentating. So I turned it off for a minute on commercial breaks when I was watching the fights to see how DC was doing. And DC always does a great job. Uh, I was very shocked yesterday when I saw um, a post on Instagram, you know, all these different pages, take tweets and stuff like that, and they create content from it. DC... Right steps down as the NCAA commentator, basically because he's sick of everybody talking shit and criticizing. I, I, am I getting that right? I think I am. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he was just upset and I, and I get it. And I get his point too. Wrestling has looked and sounded the same for a hundred years. It, it's in this, I've had this, this is a total tangent. And I hope there's a lot of wrestling fans on here that understand what I'm talking about, but I go off is about it, this all the time. There's a commentating job in wrestling. If you want it, Anthony, there you go. DC step down. If D, I'll take, I'll take that one for sure. But there's, there's a problem within the wrestling community where everything's the same. And I complain all the time. There's all these coaches and all these parents that just ruin youth wrestling. They ruin it. Like at what other point in time does winning matter? When you're in high school, maybe it starts to matter, but like these guys, they got six and seven year old kids cutting weight. They're yeah. fucking da- dads are getting thrown out of tournaments every goddamn weekend. Cause they're screaming at referees over six to seven to eight year old wrestling matches. None of that it doesn't matter. But I think what DC's point was is wrestling has looked and sounded the same for a long time. So he brings a different, uh, he brings yeah. a different attitude to it and people don't like how it sounds because they want it all to sound exactly the same as it sounded for the last 40 years. Um, yeah. And I think that was frustrating for him. Yeah, no, no, I, it is frustrating. And uh, Brian just put the tweet up there. Um, anytime you go out and you do something, people are going to criticize just like you right now, you know, at the highest level, Anthony, you're competing in the octagon and you haven't got the results that you've been looking for. So you're experiencing the same thing for a DC or myself or anybody that does anything. In this world of social media, everyone can have an opinion and you can access those opinions anytime you want. That's why mm-hmm. people always say don't read the comments. But it's kind of it's a risk and reward because we all like to read positive things about us. But, of course, there's the negative stuff as well. I think mm-hmm. the DC... I, 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 it, that was sad for me to read that about DC only because I like him and I have so much respect for DC and I'm sure you feel the same way. He's one of the nicest, warmest guys. He's got a very, very high tolerance. You don't see any drama from DC. He's just a great mm-hmm. human being. Um, but people are going to talk shit. Just rise above it. And I'm, I'm not criticizing him because I know how much DC loves wrestling. He yeah. absolutely loves it. And the fact that the trolls and the dickheads and the haters and the people that have probably never achieved 1% of what DC has, has kind of, for want of a better word, bullied him into stepping down from something that he loves. Right. It's, it's, it's a shame. It really it, is. Well, and to get a personality the size of DC to come 
to your national tournament and like wrestling has always been the redheaded stepchild of all these colleges always and now you know you get it on espn it's got this matt cast where it's playing all eight mats on on espn plus and then you get a, a personality that that's as big as dc to come on and and validate it he was a uh, multiple time all american he was a finalist uh, was on the world team you know wrestled two weight division league. champ of the ufc right a and a UFC superstar pay per views right you get Hall that guy to come spend like you think dc you think they paid him enough to make it worth this time no he loves that shit and just wanted to come and be a part of it and then they just run him out like that's why wrestling is where where it is like they eat their own from the inside out and that's why he said he stepped down as well, because somebody said, well, why don't you step down from the UFC as well? Because we always talk shit about you there. He said, yeah, mm-hmm. but the UFC pays a lot. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I imagine the NCAA different. pay the same, but still DC, um, ignore them, man. Ignore them. And I'd say the same right. things to you, Anthony. Like I always joke about the Happy Gilmore thing, harness the good energy, block the bad and all the rest. It's true, though, if you can do mm-hmm. that. But it's often easier said than done. So... Um, Vito Petrino. How do you feel about the fight? How do you feel about it? The fight, the match. I think it's a logical fight. I think he's a guy that's got some uh, momentum behind him. He just Mm -hmm. had a a win. I was going to say a good win. It wasn't a great win, but he had a win over Tyson Pedro. You know who's who's done some things in the sport, and he's got a bit of a name. Tyson retired. I kind of feel, and I don't want to badmouth Tyson Pedro, but I kind of feel like. He knew he was going to retire and his heart wasn't really in that fight. I've definitely seen a better motivated Tyson Pedro than that fight. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm forgetting off the top of my head. I think he's 12 or 13 and out. So he's undefeated. He's a hard hitter. He's not the fastest. He doesn't have the highest output. Uh, You know, I I, I respect you for taking the fight, but you've got to, I'm assuming you feel some pressure in some ways, but the only advice that I could give to you, Anthony, and we were talking about it a little bit off air, is that you've got to give this everything you have. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? You've got to cut out all outside distractions. You've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror when it's all said and done and say, I did the work. I made the distract, cut out the distractions. I did the running. I followed the diet. I didn't drink the alcohol. I did everything I could to ensure that I show up at UFC 301 as the best version of myself. If you do all that and you still don't lose the fight, well, then so be it. And that will still suck. But at least you're not going to beat yourself up and torture yourself throughout eternity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I do believe this is an important fight for the narrative of your journey. You know what I'm saying? A hundred percent. And I, I think I think I'm having so much fun because of the the mental switch a little bit. I I just thought, <laughs> like we talked about this after the last fight, where I think that I think that I let the title blind me at times, where I'm just so concerned with it and so worried about it and. And I'm just not worried about it right now. Like if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And we'll just figure that out as we go. But I always have this plan in my head, like, okay, I'm going to beat this guy. And then this guy's going to beat that guy. And then this guy will probably beat him. And then I'll try to fight that guy. And I'll walk my way all the way to how I can get to a title fight. And, but I, I think it clouds my judgment because I'm so concerned with it. So what me and my, my longtime jujitsu coach who's the longest standing coach I've ever from the very beginning, day one. Um, if it was up to him, you know, he was like, yeah, maybe we just do jujitsu for forever. <laughs> but he, uh, we made this deal. Like we're just going to fight one fight at a time and let's just go all in one at a time, whether that's once a year, twice a year, whatever that ends up being once it like, all out 100% give it everything I got. And then every single fight, we'll just, we'll get through it and we'll reevaluate and see where we are. And we, if we got to work on some jujitsu, then we take off some time a little bit, close up some holes there. We need to work on some wrestling or whatever we need to do. And then we just take another one and we go all in on that one. And then we just reevaluate after each individual fight. I feel like you do that enough times. I'm likely to find myself in a pretty good spot. So, but I can't do that if I don't like systematically just like, we only have to, I got to stop worrying about everything else. I got to stop being like, okay, so I'm going to go in here. I got to beat Vitor. And then I already have the next step planned. Next step. I got to stop worrying plan. about the next step. Yeah. I got to stop worrying about it. All. You, you gotta, have, you have. And because, because for me, for me, uh, on my journey, obviously I had the eye issue. 
Right? So mm-hmm. I was still, I was just so grateful to still being able to fight, you know, and I went through a little bit of a phase where I would win one, I would lose one. I would win one and I would lose one. And I was getting paid good money, right? Mm-hmm. I always did. I've always been very grateful for that. So I was still so appreciative to be able to be in the position to A, compete in the sport that I love and B, provide for my family whilst doing that. You know, mm-hmm. so that was just, I was just looking at it from, you know, the glass half full uh, kind of lens. And then before, you know, you know, you're doing that. So I lost one. Fuck, I got to win the next one. I won that. And then the next one, you lose that. Then you win one. But then all of a sudden, before you know it, I've pieced together a three fight winning streak. And then an opportunity comes out of the blue. You know, because I've mm-hmm. won three in a row and I've been around forever and I'd had a lot of high profile fights. I had the name. Do you know what I mean? So there's, right. there's no reason why you can't do that. You're still only 35 years old. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Focus on Vito Petrino. Whatever the hell happens after that, right. who, who, who cares? Across that bridge the Sunday morning afterwards. You get hit like, by a bus tomorrow. Out. You know what right, I mean? Right. Stop thinking about what's going to happen in two years' time. Stop stressing out about the belt or right. trying to get to – of course you want to be the champ. Everybody on this roster wants to be the champion. Do you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. it's steps. The, 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 the first step well, for you I, I think that's a trainer. life lesson. I think what you said right there is a life lesson, not just for fighting or for me. I think just in life in general, I'm. sometimes I felt like if I wasn't constantly thinking about the title or – trying to roadmap myself to it. I almost convinced myself that means I care enough. Like, well, no, like if I'm not completely focused on it, then I'm not, I'm, I'm not dialed in. And I, don't th- I think I've just tricked myself. You know, I, I think just in life in general for everybody at home, I think if you just take it one step at a time and stop worrying about it's like that stereotypical cliche that Mark Montoya says all the time, stop worrying about the destination and just focus on the journey that you're on and i used to always like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i get it well, like now i'm thinking <laughs> finally 35 i think i'm figuring out what he means by that like stop worrying about the title and just mm. like i just am really me and chris gutierrez actually have had this kind of pact with each other in the gym well i think both of us you know like you've been in training sessions and you're going over jabs right how many times have you been in that training session going over jabs and crosses or something and you, so you, sometimes you just zone out like, oh, yeah, yeah I, know what he's, I know what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Like, so I've been trying, me and Cree and Chris have been holding each other accountable. Like, oh, God, here like, we go. Sure not to escape side like, control again. Yeah, I've yeah, yeah. It. Same shit. I've I know that. how to do it. I know how to wall walk. Mm-hmm. I know how to job. Go on, you were right. saying. But it, it, and that's the mindset that you get sometimes when you've been around a long time. So we're, we're, I guess, just trying to hold each other accountable. And like, if I notice, if I look over at him, it seems like he's a little bit zoned out. Let's go tap him and say, hey, we got we to gotta check back mm-hmm. in. Like maybe it's a small detail that we're missing that could make a big difference later on. Like let's tune in to like what's really – like just be where your feet are and pay attention. So I'm just focused on one training session at a time. I'm not even worried about what Friday looks like. I'm just, I'm just focused on today and trying to be super present with where I am. Well, and that's great to hear. And the final word, and then we're going to move on, if you don't mind, because this isn't the, 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 the let's give a bloody a pep talk to Anthony Smith podcast. <laughs> I like to talk about this stuff. I do. But Jesus, we got people biting people, Anthony. We got to get to that. Final thing I'll say, and this is might sound like an insult, but it's not. Because I know that you're still a very hungry man. Right. Mm-hmm. I know that. And I know even though everything we've just said, and focus on the, the journey, not the destination. I know you still want to become a champion. You can't, but right now you've got a very comfortable life. You've got a great life. You earn good money when you fight, right? You've had a lot of fights. And now I don't know your, your actual pay, but with I, I know you get paid handsomely every time you fight. So you've got money in the bank. Yeah, You've got ESPN. You've got the mm-hmm. award-winning podcast that never wins an award. You've got... <laughs> You've got a lot of opportunities, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You, you, you've made money so life's comfortable. But but don't settle for that, do you know what I'm saying? Right. Because you, you can do more. You know, Whilst, yes, you want to focus on the journey and not the destination, and you can go on Instagram and see a million memes and cliches mm-hmm. and stoicisms and shit like that, but do you want to be the champ? Because oh, all this other champ. shit right now, all this shit that you can do is still going to be there afterwards, whether you become the champion or not. 
you know what I mean? So you have mm-hmm. to, some things in the short term, you've got to stop. You know what I mean? You got to stop right. seeing the boys. You got to stop getting on flights. You got to stop eating the foods that you like, having a cheeky Moscow, Moscow mule, and certainly not through a straw. Definitely you know what not I'm saying? <laughs> straw. No more <laughs> straws no, you know and mean? mules. Short term yeah. sacrifices will lead to mm-hmm. long term goals and gains. Good looking training camp, you sexy Let's beast. Go. So you're up Let's there go. in Colorado right now, yeah. freezing oh, your yeah. balls off. You know, it was 70 when I left over the weekend. I came back and it's 18 degrees and snowing. So Jeez, freezing my ass off. I got the I got the heat pumped in the apartment. Oh, Loving let's it. Let's go. All right, today's episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep, and this is going to solve all your sleeping problems and dramatically improve your sleep going forward because the mattress cover, the Eight Sleep pod, goes right on top of it. By the way, it's super easy to set up. You download the app, right, and you can set everything you want. It shows you all your health data. It tells you how well you sleep, and it tells you how much REM sleep you had, how much deep sleep you had. You can set alarms for you to wake up. You can set one side of the bed as low as 50. 55 degrees, the other side of the bed as high as 110 degrees. And it is super, super simple and very, very fascinating. Once you do get it set up, there is all kinds of information. But the reality is, the good news is, is that it's going to improve your sleep. The pod will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting your bed's temperature. Okay. As I said, it will go as low as 55 degrees or as high as 110. In addition to keeping you at the perfect temperature, the pod will track your sleep and your health metrics, as I said, and users see their sleep quality improve by 32% after just one month on the pod. This thing is fantastic technology and there is so much information to learn and you're so much, you know, so much, um, value to this product we're already sleeping so much better and our sleep quality is improving every single night and there's no better way to improve your day to day than better sleep and the easiest way to do that is with eight sleeps pod three start the new year right and invest in the rest that you deserve with the eight sleep pod cover so give it a try you won't be disappointed we love it rebecca loves it she never stops bloody going on about it that would be the only drawback she's always talking about her sleep metrics and stuff like that get involved though go to eightsleep.com slash bisping you will get two hundred dollars off and free shipping eightsleep.com forward slash bisping for a two hundred dollar discount and free shipping so anyway ladies and gentlemen we've got a lot of stuff to get through today and in just about 25 30 minutes we're gonna have the one the only the former i do believe two-time strawweight champion of the ufc i am of course talking about the victorious rose thug rose namayunas joining us who was victorious at the weekend so we'll save the discussion on her fight for then um we got a, the first fight of the night it's two Brazilians. They came off the contender series. I can't even remember the names. I can look it up, but it's not essential to the story. Right. Serino or something. I forget. Doesn't matter. We don't need to it know his matter. name. Yeah, they, they, we, definitely don't, we ain't going to be saying that name again. So I'm watching the fights, right? I'm sitting on the couch. I've just been out. We've gone for a walk. We've had a bit of lunch. I'm sitting there, you know, I was looking at the phone, the whole thing. And mm-hmm. I think it's the first fight of the night. I, I, needed, I needed to go to the bathroom. I needed a dump. Right, mm-hmm. you got to know. Got I'm you got like, to. It's, a, it's a, it's a, it happens. It's a natural bodily function. People like to scoff and go, "Ooh, we all do it." Mm. I thought now's the time to do it because it's the first fight of the night. If there's uh, if one that I can afford to miss, it's this one. It's, yeah. I go to, yeah, logical. I, I sit on the toilet and then I just hear Paul Felder and everyone losing their minds. I'm like, fuck, shit. And then John, who's my YouTube editor, goes, "Oh my god, did you see that? Somebody just got bit." I'm like, what the hell? And I tried to back it up on ESPN Plus, but you can't back it up. Anyway, I've seen it everywhere. What the hell? What are we doing? Look at who's buying the shit out of him. Bite of the night. That's insane, man. That is insane. Away with that. Well, I, I I don't think he did think he would get it. Well, because I don't think he was thinking in the moment, and and I'm. It's it's a shame for that guy. And there's the bite mark there. And he actually got it tattooed. Did you see that? Yeah, I did see that. <laughs> he turned the bite mark into a tattoo, which is really cool, actually. Rebecca thought, why is he doing that? Um, listen, he's, he, he's a skilled mixed martial artist. He was looking good. Apparently, he was undefeated. They both were. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about 
where he's from in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's a tough part of town, right? Yeah. And it's not the first person he's been, I'd imagine. Because you got to be a certain type of person to <laughs> resort to biting somebody. He wasn't even getting his ass kicked. He wasn't was even say, getting choked out. You know, like if you get choked out and you're like, you bastard, ah. mm, give him a little nibble. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're winning. You're in the driver's seat and you just thought, mm, I'm out of <laughs> Fuck it. A yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I don't, my brain can't compute that. That's that's where I'm having the. I know I'm like speechless over here, but I don't understand it. Like, you're not losing, you're not getting pummeled. Where you feel like you got to go into fight or flight, and like, you know, you're rocked, and maybe you don't know where you are, and you just grab a hold of something and bite it. Like, I don't. It was even weird how he did it. Like from the back of his arm, like yeah, nuzzled his nose in there like a puppy, like trying to cuddle and just bit the shit out of him. It's weird. It's like so weird. It's it like what a bad look of, for us. Well, it's it's and unfortunately we're not in 2003 when we were called human yeah. cockfighting. You we've come a long way since then. But like if you think of gentlemanly conduct, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. like uh, what did they call it? Fair game in the boxing in the gy gypsy world. They'll fight with the fist. If someone hits the floor, you don't follow them down. Uh, and a lot of boxing pews still think that what we do is crazy. You know what I mean? You see people getting elbowed in the face and all the rest of it. Yeah, who in the right mind? Even on the streets, in the in a street fight, if, if as long unless you're unless you're going to get murdered, you do whatever you can. You, unless right. the guys, you, you know what I mean, come to your house and he's trying to really do something bad, then whatever mm -hmm. you can find, you know what I mean. But if you're getting into a one on one fight and you resort to biting the guy, I'm sorry, that's disgusting, utterly yeah. disgusting. Yeah, you, you don't bite, you don't grab the balls, you, you like gotta keep it gentlemanly. A knee in the balls. Knee in the balls is okay. Grabbing them is weird. I'll, I'll, I would need people always talk about just naming the balls, but I've never done that. I'll, I, I'll just go for the knockout shot. I'd rather punch you in the face than knee you in the balls, bro. <laughs> yeah, right. Do right. You know what I mean? Knee like the balls. Like if you were, if, if you were like in a balls. life or death situation, I always think it's weird when you see those, uh, what do you I'll call bite the, the balls? The charlatans that teach martial arts online and they pull up that bullshit. Like there was like, and then the the groin strike with the knee. Like if my goal is to kill you, like you're gonna, it's gonna take more than a ball shot and a tummy ache. It's probably not always, gonna stop me. And I always talk about this in mixed martial arts. You know, when people go to shoot a double leg takedown and they go to fire the knee, you mm -hmm. know, to knee them in the face as they're coming in. If you time it perfectly to where the patella. The actual knee, the hard part of the knee connects with the face. That's fantastic. But it's not very often you see people time it perfectly. A lot mm. of the time you connect with the thigh, the soft, right. meaty part of the thigh. And that doesn't hurt too much. And you give them the takedown. Yeah, I was like, you really you know just I mean? gave them a single leg. <laughs> You've just given them a takedown, bro. Yeah. Uppercuts are best. I'm not sure why I got onto this. Um, it's a good point, though. Is that... Well, it's a great point, though, that a lot of people miss. So, well, just time the knee. Oh, yeah. Just feed them a takedown. Uppercut them. Yeah. You know why? See, I don't throw a lot of uppercuts because I, I don't know why. I think it's the shoulder dip that throws me off when I go to, to load it. And then I throw it. I don't think I exit fast enough because I always get countered on the way out. Always. I always not like to uppercut up. if they're coming in because even if you miss the uppercut... The underhook is right the there. The, yeah, under, yeah, yeah. the underhook is right. All you're gonna do is that. The underhook is there to defend mm -hmm. the takedown. At least you get one underhook in. You right. know what I mean? Like an uppercut. You like you're coming in with an un, underhook. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Well, I've got to get over to Factory X, bro. You gotta give get you some out data. Here. Jesus Listen, Christ! I've got Mike, so much knowledge. Mike, we, got a, we, got, we got a great team here. All we got. You let me know. You, I'll get my people a hold of your people, and we'll fly you here to Denver. <laughs> Oh tomorrow oh, tomorrow God. morning I, number one i'm joking secondly the pressure i would feel would be unbelievable i have not coached anything in years i remember you don't I did need a to seminar. actually coach though it's it's like it's not like you're coaching a team just be like great detail stuff with a friend He's doing great, Mark. He's doing great. I'd like to see him keep his left hand up a little bit maybe check those kicks but you're, you you guys I've been are checking doing kicks like a too i've been checking <laughs> kicks like crazy it's been it's been great. 
Well, carry on checking them for the next bloody eight weeks, you prick. <laughs> uh, um, is that and Harrington and Brian? Welcome to the show, everybody. Biting somebody, I turned the hat off, Harrington. That wasn't on before. All right, he can leave it on. No, you can put it back. On. <laughs> <laughs> no, we prefer it actually if you just put it back. Yeah, on. yeah, on or off, it's your call. I'm just messing with you, Harrington. Come on, buddy. Welcome oh. to the show, boys. Um, Let's let's have a roundtable discussion. Is that the worst foul we've ever seen in the UFC? I think so. I th- if not, it has to be up there. I mean, a bite? We've never seen a bite in the UFC before, right? I don't it's like as bad as a blatant I eye gouge. I was going to say there's that. There, I thought that Mike would go with the, the eye gouge. The Cachoeira? Cachoeira? It, Oh was yeah, eye gouging the shit out of Priscilla uh, Cachuara. Yeah, yeah. I remember, she was eye gouging the shit out of someone that had her in a rear naked choke, and she was be- like going back and thumbing the hell out of her eye. I thought that one was Jillian pretty bad Robertson. too. Jillian I think Robertson on the same level. The Paul Daly one against Josh Koscheck, but that was kind yeah. of after the fact. But again. I like Paul. I've known him for a long time. Yeah. But that was, you know, you were asking to get kicked out of the organization with that one. I just yeah, Googled a list here, and it has the five worst, but this was 2022. Rafael Natal versus Uriah Hall. What happened yeah. there? Uh, so he started the fight. There was, like, bad blood between them, and he started the fight with, like, literally a punt kick right to the groin. Like, it was oh. very blatant nut shot. Piotr Jan, Aljamain Sterling is in there at number three. Ooh, look at what's number one on that list. What is it? Is it are you on sports key? John Jones versus Anthony Smith. <laughs> that was, number one. That was a pretty blatant knee to the face. I'm sorry. That was a pretty, that was a pretty nasty one. It was I'm surprised. I didn't make it for Jorge Rivera. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just, I, I was going to say, wow, well, you know, that one guy, the English yeah. guy got all angry and started screaming and hollering. Yeah, well, he's a goddamn prick. Um, real quick before we move on from uh, from what happened Saturday night. He definitely uh, well, got cut, right? Oh, definitely. Dana fired him immediately. He was and, cut? and he gave the other, other guy a $50,000 bite of the night bonus. <laughs> nice. And on top yeah. of that, about it. Nevada State Athletic Commission stepped in. They said they are keeping his 10K that was in escrow as well. So he's walking away completely empty-handed from that fight. Good. Well, awesome. you have to be held accountable. You go out yeah, there, you, you get flown to Las Vegas, you put on a big platform like ESPN, and then you're going to go out there and bite somebody. you got to be held accountable, let alone. I mean, that could be deemed... At what point does what you're doing in the octagon, if you've got blatant disregard for the, the rule sets... What point does that become assault? That, that's yeah, what I at was some just point thinking. that's illegal. Yeah, at some point that's you know, illegal. You know, you know what I'm saying? Just yeah. because you're in a fight, we have a a set of rules which are agreed upon mm-hmm. by the athletic commission. Biting people never has, was, or is a part of that. You can't go out there and it, it, it's one step away from pulling out a baseball bat covered in barbed wire. Same shit. That's not allowed. I just want to ask you guys, because I was talking to somebody in our ad sales team about that, and they were like, dude, that's got to be like a grounds for suing, right? Like, there's got to be a civil suit there. And I was like, I don't know, because these guys, like I, you've said before, Michael, you sign a piece of paper that says, if I die in that cage, it's, you know, it's it, I'm assuming that responsibility. So biting has to be covered under that, right? No, no, no. I, I, I And I don't quote me on this, but I do seem to recall, and I have not studied the UFC contracts in quite some time, but I seem to remember back in 2006 or five when I first got it, and I did just have a little skim through it, and I did see some verbiage about if you die. If you die, oh, it's a shame, but you can't then sue. If he dies, he dies. If if he dies, he dies. But if you get bit, no one's, you're not agreeing to get bit. You're not agreeing that someone's going to sneak a knife in. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you definitely get prosecuted if you did some, like, weird video game shit, like put concrete in your gloves or something yeah, stupid yeah, like yeah. that, you know? Well, like, you'd go to civil, jail. There's been civil suits for guy like, pack their boxing gloves, and then they get, you know, they find it out later, and they're able to sue that fighter for whatever damages they were able to prove. So, I mean, it's got to, there's got to be some case of a civil suit there. If, if you bite me, I don't know that I'm suing, but you're getting jumped in the parking <laughs> lot for sure. Do you know of any uh, old school cheating techniques, Anthony? One that they used to do long time ago. Now you probably can't get away with it, certainly in America because they have the commissions. But you know the tape? 
that they, mm-hmm. they, they, they wrap your hands with, what they used to do was put it on a wall and then roll it up and then up and down, up and down. And it makes like a rock hard, like piece of tape. And you, mm-hmm. you do that loads of times and you put it on there and then you cover it up with regular flat tape. So oh, underneath shit. that, it's hard as hell, you know, and that's an old Dutch trick from when I'm led. Yeah. Led that to feels the- like it's all of a deadly weapon. Yeah. Back in the day, yeah. and I think people still do this, but not not anybody that I know personally, but I can't imagine that they don't. And you've heard, I don't know, you hear some people bitching about it. Back in the day, guys used to take, uh, like when they're cutting weight, they would use the bathtub or whatever, or the night before the fight or the morning of, they would take a hot bath and put a shit ton of baby oil in the water with them. Yeah, of course. And then their body would suck up the baby oil. But then when you get off and you're dry and you wipe off, your skin's normal. The second you start to sweat, though, you're just sweating baby oil out of your pores and you can't and they can't grapple. So that was a classic. People George St. Pierre, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, Who George St. Pierre doing that? <laughs> Brian, 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 do not, do not slander the good name of George St. Pierre. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> Christ, how dare you? What, what, what are you going to say next? O'Malley had gel in his hair? <laughs> <laughs> what a mess, what a mess all that has turned out to be. Like nah, the post-fight all, fallout from that. Nah, it's all good. It's all good. Harrington, talking about what we were saying earlier, number six in the notes. Break it down. Uh, yes, yeah, so Ron DeSantis has passed the bill. Uh, we're in Florida. If you are under the age of 14, you are not going to be allowed to have a social media account starting in January of 2025. Anybody who currently has one under the age of 14 years old, it will be deleted. Um, worth noting, Instagram, Instagram, uh, sorry, Meta's terms of service uh, state that you have to be at least 13 uh, to have a social media platform. So, Right. So if you've got to be 13... And they're making the law 14. Okay, no, no, thanks for mentioning that last part, Harrington, because essentially it doesn't change anything anyway. But I think a lot of, I know for a fact that I've signed Lucas up and my other kids to stuff when they were younger than that. I've just mm-hmm. said, just change your date of birth or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm not talking social media stuff, but you know what I mean? I forget mm-hmm. what it was now. I, I truly do forget what it was. But anyway, how do you feel about that? Just as a concept, 14 and under or under 14, no social media. I think it really depends on what kind of parent you are. My kids won't be on social media before then anyways, but well, sort of. My, my, my oldest daughter has TikTok, but it's extremely monitored. There's crazy settings and like the, she really doesn't do much on it. Her, it's her and her like 10 friends, but um. I know where Brian's going to go with this because he doesn't like the government overreach, but um, yeah, I don't disagree. I don't yeah, disagree. I, I don't think I I'm, I, I'm fine with children 14 and under not being on social media. I think that's probably for the best if we're being, when is social media? You could, I, I, I guess I, it wasn't I a thing when you were that young, but no, no, it wasn't when I was young, for sure. I think it's absolutely for the best. I mean, going back to what we said before, talking yeah. about your fights, talking about DC, even mm-hmm. big, tough guys like you and Daniel Cormier, it still affects you. Mm-hmm. We yeah. were talking last week, we had Rebecca mm-hmm. on, we were at a little segment, it was one Thursday, we were talking about bullying. You know, mm-hmm. these young, impressionable girls, they get bullied. They feel under so much pressure and strain to look like other girls. That's why the filters are out of control. You know what I mean? Good yeah. luck. If you're on one of these like Tinder websites and you're looking yeah, you're at screwed. <laughs> and you think that's what you're going to go and meet up with. No, bro. No, bro. Yeah. Those I've things seen, would make I've you seen, and I even good looking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? But for young men as well, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it's. I don't understand other than obviously learning stuff, looking at stuff, judging people, all the rest of it. I don't understand what benefit they would get out of it anyway. No, no. I think any, all the benefits they're going to get out of it are going to be negative. Probably um, anything they take from it long-term is going to be negative. And, and it's really the, for my wife and I, at least the, it's the bullying factor. Cause like Snapchat, it, it's funny that we even brought this up because I was actually just listening to, I'm really boring guys. I've listened to congressional hearings a lot and they had Mm. the, the CEO of Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, uh, and discord. We're all at this congressional hearing, like forced to be there. And essentially Congress was like trying to put some, like figure out what the hell's going on and, and how do we keep kids safe and all the, 
you know, the sex trafficking and all the, the yeah, I saw the, that the, one. The I think we images. Spoke about this weeks ago, yeah, did we? But anyways, well, no, um, no, no, no. This is, sorry, on on a Thursday. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, but it, it, like, just for my wife and I, that's what it is. It's the bullying and the like. The, I mean, that's a, a social media is a window for anybody to come in through to your right into your kids' phones. I mean, they're, I just don't think well, they're old enough at that point to to manage that and navigate it. No, for sure. And then there's the other side. Obviously, there's drugs being sold via social mm-hmm. media and Snapchat right. and all the rest of it. We talked about that. But also, it, like, you don't get reality on social – very rarely, very rarely. Right. You get people's best ideological version of life. We're all happy. Everything's perfect. Look at us. I've got the perfect relationship. I've got loads of money. I've got a beautiful car. We're eating in the finest restaurants. You know, we're flying here. Look at our hotel. And nine times out of ten, it's bullshit. And they're putting yeah. forward this, this want-to-be reality. That mm-hmm. doesn't exist for them. You know what it's I mean? All fake. Like, yeah. like it's like most all of fake. the time, most of the time, and, and Brian just looked this up. There is a there is been in a survey, but uh, you know, most of these couples, I mean Rebecca, we've got a great relationship. We're not out there professing our undying love for each other every five minutes on social media. Do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it turns out the majority of these people that are, they're they're the ones that break up. They're the ones that have yes. no real foundation in their relationships. I don't know what the Google search is, Brian, but there is a Google search, and I want you to come up with the stats, the info, the percentages. I, I say this all the time. Anytime I see, like, you see a couple on Instagram or Facebook, or you know, my wife's got. I don't have Facebook. My wife has it, and she'll be like, "Oh, look at this," and, and it's it's like these random couples that are just constantly talking about how great how great they are and how much fun they have and how much they love their partner. And I always I always joke with Michaela and say, "Oh." I wish I loved my wife that much. <laughs> like, I just don't get it. Like, I always, I thought for the longest time, like, are we the only ones that aren't like super PDA and like mushy mushy? Like, oh no, we have an actual real life yeah. functioning marriage. That's a goddamn shit show going on over there. And they're probably on their up and down roller coasters. I love you. I hate you. I love you. I hate you. Like, I think we're the normal ones probably, Mike. Yeah, it's it's because, as you say, you have a real relationship. You don't need to put it out there for the world to see. Mm-hmm. If you and your partner know that, it doesn't matter. You don't need to put it out there to the world. Right. Your partner right. knows. You know. Other than mm-hmm. that, it's nobody's business. And people don't want to see that all the time. Who do you think you're impressing? You know? I mean, <laughs> granted, weird. sometimes, you know, they'll be like, oh, God, look at these. They've cracked it. What a, oh, love you guys. Great. Rel- Nobody cares. Yeah, nobody says nobody. that. Oh, do you see Mike and Rebecca today? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> nobody says that. They just Sometimes scroll by I'm and say, like, oh, they're mad at each other. They must be fighting. <laughs> yeah, or, or if, like, on the rare occasion she looks good, I'll be like, let's get a picture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let's celebrate <laughs> on the this rare moment. Case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, you really pulled yourself together tonight. You've been on the treadmill. Let's celebrate this. Let's get a picture on. Uh, Joe, she's beautiful. Here's your, here's your stats. Uh, Brian put them up there for you. Yeah, this isn't the one. I saw this, but I'll read it out, Brian. It's not the start I wanted because I did see it. But it says, data suggests that social media is now a factor in one in seven divorces with a similar number admitting that Mm -hmm. they look online for evidence that their partner has been unfaithful. Social media has also been said. Yeah, exactly. No, it it does contribute to, um, you know, the demise of relationships. But there was another study done recently where it showed that the majority of these people that are always going on about how perfect life is, Turns out it's not perfect. And I don't know how we got onto this. How did we get onto this? Social oh, God, media. Social media TikTok ban. In Florida. Yeah. Not good for kids. Brian, you're saying, please, just, I, is it I just TikTok you. or Is it just TikTok or all social media, Brian? Well, TikTok's going to be a thing of the past soon anyway, because they're trying to get rid of that unless it's sold to a non-Chinese company. We should buy but it. I don't think they'd let that happen. I'll buy it. Yeah. Oh, you got that kind of money? <laughs> you no, we're going to need a loan. Me. We're gonna need yeah. to go <laughs> to buy TikTok. <laughs> um, as much as I hate uh, government overreach and them telling me that I can't do things in the royal sense, I don't think social media should exist in general. Uh, I think that the way that it's set up is literally to destroy society and Western <laughs> culture in particular. I'm okay with this. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mean. That's a Brian take. It's designed to destroy culture. Well, I mean, the government did use it like during 
It is designed to destroy uh, like culture. COVID, like it's not designed COVID. to destroy culture. Hundred percent of this. It's initially designed for people to keep in touch with one another. Well, it's Facebook just initially, like Facebook, was initially just for college. Like it, it has college. morphed into a control mechanism for the powers you know, that. You know, be. when Facebook first came out, I couldn't even have Facebook because I didn't go to yeah. college, and it came out Me like too. my senior year. Yeah, um, I didn't have a no, college. No, of email. course, Instagram to start with was a photography god it was so stupid too like when it first came like this shit's stupid Not yeah instagram, this instagram was a, a photography app <clears throat> and then yeah it evolved into what it is today now of course given the algorithms and government stepping in where they shouldn't be doing and it is used for other things but the destruction of society i'm just going to throw it out there that's a step too far. And I'm just going to throw it out there as well. Kate Middleton is not dead. She's not ah, murdered by the elites, Brian. Arguably. Off the screen. Off the screen. Off the screen. Yeah. Did he? Was he, he said, arguing that she was dead? She, she's been murdered, Michael. She's been murdered. That's the conspiracy. How about this? She's sick. It's a private matter. It's nobody's yeah. goddamn business. She's I watched got the children. Video. She's she got popped bloody. up and got cancer. She's got cancer, the poor woman. Yeah, she doesn't want to talk about it. Maybe her kids don't know. You know what I mean? But everyone's yeah. really talking about it. All right, guys, let's talk about Sheath Underwear, the official underwear of the UFC and, of course, this podcast. Sheath sponsored us a long time ago, and I am so glad that they are back because they are just incredible underwear, and that's why they're being so successful. That's why they, they are the official underwear of the UFC because not only do they look great, they feel great. They're stylish designs, and they are the most comfortable underwear that I have ever worn. As I say, high quality. I've still got some of the original uh, pairs that they sent me years ago. I only wear sheath underwear as well, by the way, because they keep everything cool, separated, and friction-free for training. And by the way, because of the pouch, it keeps everything in place. So at some point, you need to buy underwear. So do yourself a favor and buy it from Sheath. Dot com support sheath.com support this podcast and support your balls in the correct way possible in a stylish way in a comfortable way so go to sheath.com sheath underwear is made by the way from high quality fabrics and has a dual pouch system to keep everything separated or you can just wear them as regular briefs so as i say one more time go to sheath.com and the code that you want to use the promo code is believe 20 to get 20 percent off your order the official Official underwear of the UFC is available at sheath.com. The code is believe20 to get 20% off your order. Any who, any way, what do you say? Where do we go? Bro. Um, Thug Rose, we'll talk about that. Sean Strickland yeah. may be busy. The rumors are swirling that he is in negotiations to fire Hamzat Chimeyev in Saudi Arabia. Hold on. But Robert Whitaker said that I can see them making, he said that he's a, he's hoping that Drickers fights Izzy. He said, I can see them make, uh, see them, UFC, making them, uh, making that fight Izzy because of the bad blood between Izzy and Drickers because of South Africa. I can't really see the UFC getting behind Sean Strickland again. I don't think they loved him as a champ to begin with, so I don't think they're really gunning for that rematch. I don't know. I'm kind of hoping Drickers gets Izzy in a sense so that I can fight Sean Strickland. So Robert is calling for Strickland. Rumours online is that Strickland's fighting Hamzat. What does Anthony Smith say? I like the I like the Hamzat Strickland fight. I don't know that the UFC probably hated Strickland as a champion, it, whether it's abrasive or not, he draws. So I don't, I don't know that they probably care too much about that. I don't think that probably matters. I think they're just looking for the best next fight. And I don't think that they redo that fight. I don't think people are begging for it. Typically when you see immediate rematches like that, I think it's when the, when the fans want it and the crowd wants it. I do think that Strickland could get one more win and probably get a, a title shot right away, though. Well, Sean's been beating the drum a bit lately, saying it's bullshit. You know, everybody mm -hmm. gets immediate rematches, and we spoke about that. Hey. But never mind that. Look hey. at this. The one and only Thug Rose making the debut on the world's best MMA podcast. Rose, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Of course, Anthony Smith, not, don't, mm -hmm. don't need to make an introduction there. How the hell are you doing? 
Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, no, it's long, long overdue. We were just talking before. Before, we said, we've never had Rose on. Unbelievable. Yeah. You scare me, Rose. I'm very intimidated <laughs> by you. Do you know what I mean? I see you when you're locked in fight week and you've got like the overalls on, you've got the shaved head and you're stoic and you're looking <laughs> tough. I'm like, I'm not messing with her. Yes. Uh, talk us through the fight Saturday night and congratulations on a great victory. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was definitely not like the easiest fight. Um, you know, there was some back and forth moments. I think I... Overall, I dominated, you know, um, there, I had a, a couple slip up moments or, you know, some shots ca got in, but overall, um, I was happy with my performance. I, there were some things that I had worked on in the camp that I wish I could have showed itself. You know, I think I, I know I'm capable of a lot better. I know I was capable of like, if I could do it over again, I, I definitely, um, you know, would, would look for more finishing opportunities, but, uh, Overall, I, I had a lot of pressure on me, so I was like, I'm just happy I got the, the job done. Rose, like, I've always admired you and, and, and Pat and, like, you just your transparency on, like, what's going on in your head and where you're at in life. And um, I try to do the same, and, you know, I'm constantly on here talking about therapy and trying to keep my shit together in my own head. Mm -hmm. um, but you were kind of you were kind of out for a while and and we didn't hear much from you and then you, you know you pop up and you got this awesome fight and everyone's pumped about it but what what does that time away look like like what are you doing because you said you had a lot of pressure so i'm assuming you probably had a long training camp it always seems like yours are kind of long um yeah. like what does that all look like in your head as you're trying to work it all out yeah i mean i guess a lot of what we do you know uh i think we end up making things bigger than what they are you know um but uh, so that's definitely what I did. Um, I mean, there's definitely a lot of life changes that I had. I I um, been taking care of my 86 year old grandmother from Lithuania, so that was oh, a huge no. thing. Um, yeah, I moved. Uh, I bought a you know a new house. So like there was a bunch of like stuff like that outside of fighting. And then obviously within my career, um, just making that transition to 125 itself was you know there was uh, was uh i guess many you know things that i had to adjust but you know not too bad it's just it's just something to do and then um and then coming off with two losses in a row that was that was tough um and then yeah uh i because that's never happened before so i definitely i think i kind of like pushed it out of my mind but i think in like my subconscious that was definitely bothering me more than i kind of gave it credit for and other than that you know just been really focusing on my spirituality and just you know, building my relationship with God, that's, that's been, you know, number one, but everything else, you know, just kind of like life and trying to find a balance. Were you focusing on, the, sorry, sorry to jump uh, in, Mike. I, I, I just want to follow that one real quick, focusing on the stuff that really matters, Rose. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because fighting, of course, it's a wonderful thing and we're all lucky to have done it and have the career and make some money. But when, but it doesn't last forever. You know what I mean? And that's not what's really important. And I just, Rebecca, when we watched your fight Saturday night, my wife, Rebecca, said this to me. And obviously, uh, we shared the same locker room, but I'd just been choked out unconscious. You'd had a tough fight. You know what I mean? I don't, I, I don't remember any of it. But Rebecca said, oh, I, I, I've always been a huge fan of Rose. And she said, I'll never forget. Uh, afterwards, in the locker room, when the fights were all finished, you and Pat were talking and you were inquiring about your flowers or the plants that you'd planted at home. You were saying, <laughs> how are the plants and all the rest of it? She said, I was kind of earwigging and listening in. And she just thought that was the most beautiful thing ever. That after a fight, you just defended the title, won the title, <laughs> knocked out your money on JJ, and you're bothered about your plants at home. So yeah, how were the plants? I, I know. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Anthony. No, you're fine. Yeah, no, it's funny because, um, like, that's actually – Obviously, um, I love what I do. I love fighting. Um, I, I probably love it more than I give it credit for half of the time. I know I know. I only have, you know, so, I mean, we know this isn't forever, right? And so when it's over, it's over. So I'm, I'm trying to enjoy as much of it as I can. But, uh, you know, ever since I was a little girl, it's, I've always wanted to be a farmer. I don't know why that's been my dream. <laughs> and so I'm just using fighting to, to get to that point, to get to you know, just be in nature. And I, you know, so, so at that time, that was my first time successfully growing like a, a tomato plant. And it was funny because <laughs> I still have to, I wish I had it here, but um, there's a picture that I took right after I won the belt and I came home to a, like my very first tomato <laughs> right then. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I was just holding it up. With the I made this. 
Yeah, yeah, it's great. It was, it's a great picture. So, um, so it was like I got the bill and I got a tomato. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, not that I want to bring it back to like a negative place, and it may, it, honestly, it might just be, be me being more curious just for myself, but. Mm-hmm. You know, when you, you were talking about you lost two in a row, you'd never lost two in a row before. And, and yeah. me and Mike talk about this all the time that I got to stay off of social media because I get my feelings hurt all the time. Yeah, um, the but like you, you see what people say and like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe he doesn't have it or maybe Rose doesn't, doesn't have that edge anymore or whatever. Like, how do you keep because you're so in tune with your feelings and like what's going on and like very honest about yourself? Yeah. Like, were, were you having second thoughts or, or was it like, all right, well, we just got to make some tweaks and then we'll fix those problems? Or were you kind of like, man, maybe I don't have it anymore? Or like, like yeah, where the, were you at? Yeah, the, de- the, the thought of it, whether I have it or not still is uh, was definitely circulating in my mind a bunch of times. Because even like um, to this point, I know like when I go to practice, this actually was one of the better camps that I've had in a while. And um, like my performances at practice were amazing. I had a couple of days where I wasn't like the best version of myself, but um, so I experienced a little bit of everything. Um, and I knew that it was possible to wake up that day and you just, you know, you don't, you, you just not, you're performing to your best ability and you yeah, did everything. It's just, God, yeah. I just woke up that day. But um, so I knew that was possible, but I still had that question of like, okay, I know I'm actually better than I've ever been. Like even the performance that I gave, I still know that I'm capable of a better performance. Um, but I still did, pretty good, you know, um, considering, but, uh, but I, um, I guess what I was trying to say is, um, it's not a question of like, I didn't, I didn't doubt myself whether I was better than Amanda or, or if I've, you know, cause my resume speaks for itself. Like she's still, she's really good, but she still has to get that experience. Um, I was just wondering like, okay, do I want it as bad? Do I, you know, and then do I still got it? Those are like kind of two similar, but separate things. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I kind of forgot where I was going with that, but, um, but I, guess I, think, you I, answered, I think you answered my question. I, yeah. you weren't, you weren't like, like you knew you still had it and you're, and you're definitely good enough. It's just maybe just some like, of the will stuff. <laughs> yeah. Will you? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and I think ultimately I just had to be like content, you know, because I did everything that I could, you know, I, I, I really, I really, you know, put my best foot forward. Um, but uh, I just, I just kind of submit to like, and, and I, I had to come to peace with like, okay, if I did everything I could and I showed up and it just, it didn't work out for me either. It's like, you know, I, I it's not whether I wasn't sh- like, if I, if I wasn't successful, it wasn't like I was about to retire or anything, but, or maybe I was depending on like, if I got severely injured or something like that, then right. I probably would have like, okay, this is dangerous, but um, I probably would have just kind of just thought about having like a few more fights and just have fun with those fights and not so much worry about the belt. Whereas now that I've been successful and I, I see that I have something to build on now, I'm like, okay, you know, uh, going after this 125 belt is like a realistic thing for me. Like I always knew that mm-hmm. it's possible and I have the opportunity. So it's like, you know, let me, let now me not real. pass it up. Yeah. Like I'm still young enough to be able to do that, but it's like, can I, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I know, well, I know that it's possible, you know, excuse me. Um, you're only 31 years old, Rose. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was just looking at your Wikipedia page there and it's obviously you still, you still look like a young lady. I don't know why I was surprised, but you've just been around <laughs> the UFC for so long. I'm yeah. going to choose my words carefully. So you made the <laughs> UFC debut December, 2014. So in calendar years, that's 10 years. So you were either 21 or 22 when mm-hmm. you started fighting for the UFC. Yeah. But as we get older, we realize 21's a child. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm 45 now. When I was 21, though, I thought I was the man. I thought I had everything (laughs) figured out and I was all grown up. But what's that been like from 21 to 31, growing up in the spotlight, high-profile fights, becoming the champion of the world? You know, I mean, I I, I, I bet that's been a tough road in some ways. It really has, yeah, because, yeah, having that attention on you, and it's it's such a huge responsibility, and there's so many things, like, just in MMA itself, like the sport is so unique because, you know, you have all these different martial arts that you got to learn and, you know what I mean? So there's, so there's different things you got to learn in the physical sense, but then just like the entertainment, uh, the entertainment side of things and like managing your money. And then like, and not just that, but like, 
personal relationships and like the, oh man and then most of us we all come from some sort of background so it's like you know we're fighting against generational curses and <laughs> you know I mean? there's like, a reason why we all step into cages <laughs> yeah yeah so you know it's it's all around like it, it's it's been a crazy journey um and but i've learned so much i've i've been so thankful to have so many um you know learning experiences and be able to like still just like pick myself back up you know um so yeah i i'm yeah very grateful for that i feel like we've seen you have like multiple different parts of like your life. It's almost like because of the ultimate fighter and, and just like the visibility and how popular you were or are. And especially as a champion, I feel like we've seen you almost grow up a little bit. Do you feel like that? Yeah. A hundred percent. Like <laughs> the most it's of crazy. my adult, yeah. My adult life has been like UFC and that's pretty much, you know, pretty much it aside from like some hobbies and some, you know, family, like, you know, friends. But <laughs> aside from that, it's like, I, I don't really have much of a life outside of that. So, you know, um, just like my childhood growing up, but yeah, uh, it's, it's been a huge blessing too. I mean, I, I'd never like looking back at my childhood, it's like everything that I was doing, like, I didn't know what I was doing, but it just all prepared me for this. Um, I had no idea I'd be a, you know, professional fighter. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know, but, but luckily I've, I've, I've been able to really, um, to I've, the one thing that's really helped me is just being able to learn from other people around me and really, you know, take the good things and then learn from the bad things as well that other people do. And kind of just, you know, like they say, it takes a village. Like I really, I've been really blessed to, to have traveled the world and been around so many different people see so many different people, the way they train, the way they live their lives, the way they have managed their career, the way they transitioned out of their career, like, cause that's a whole nother thing. So, um, so yeah, I just, I just try to, you know, learn as I go and take it all in, you know? So I know what the answer to this question is going to be because making 125 is a whole lot easier than making 115 pounds. I know the answer already before I ask it, but as I said, I looked at your Wikipedia page quickly and the things that jump out, of course, the two victories over Joanna and Jan Jacek, incredible fights, great rivalry. And you've got to be the only woman to beat Zhang Wei Li twice as well. Um, does that not tempt you? You know, because, you know, you would think that Zhang being a gr tremendous champion that she is, you know, you would think that she would welcome a third fight with you. So how tempting is that to, to say, I'm going to go back down to 115 and take that fight and become a champion again? So, um, I mean, it, like at the moment, not very tempting. I wouldn't say like never or absolutely no. I mean, obviously, if the price is right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah right. always. So, yeah, so if there's if there's an interesting offer, but I'm open to it. Um, but I really, I really want to, you know, become two division champion. I really think that that has to be my main focus. And then, you know, if I can do that, then maybe, you know, what I'm saying, like add a cherry on the top or something. But yeah, yeah. Uh, just thinking about like, because I did a lot of work to try to you know, not just be like chubby, but like actually build some muscle and like, you know, so that was, that was a lot um, for me to, cause I've, cause actually even like early in my career, it wasn't until like, maybe, I don't know, like, like 2000, like shoot, probably right before the Ioana fight, like the Michelle Watterson fight, like I was, I was still kind of like a smaller straw weight. And then slowly I kind of like got, just kept getting bigger and bigger. And, um, so so it's always been sort of harder for me to like put on size um like keep on size because i like i just work out so much and my metabolism was higher but but now that i'm a little bit older it's like it, it's i think it's the perfect time for me to make this transition and um and so i've been making it and it's been a lot of work so to like undo all of that and just go back down just because i already beat whaley twice i mean and to, to be honest like to be totally honest like you know, the beating her the second time was a little bit harder than the first, you know, <laughs> so to a little bit. Time, <laughs> yeah. I, it never gets easier than the first time. I mean, that was the, yeah. the best head kick ever. Right. Yeah. And so it's just like to be motivated for that. Like, I got to be motivated because she's she's a she's a, you know, the best like she's yeah. she's win awesome. or lose. It's going to suck, probably. Yeah. yeah. So in order to, like, get up for that one, I got to be really motivated, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so you talked a little bit about what you want next. I don't feel like very often, I don't, I can't recall too many other times I've like seen you mention names or, or like people specifically, you usually kind of like, yeah, we'll figure it out as we go. But, um, the Macy one was kind of shocking to me because I thought you guys were fairly friendly, kind of both being around Colorado and. Yeah. I don't have an issue with her. Um, I just, you know, she used to call me out when she was like, younger before she got in the UFC and like I was the champ at the time. Like oh, been in the- <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It's just like, we have a little bit of history, but I don't, I don't have anything personal against her. I just, I just noticed that she's, she's been wanting to fight me a long time ago. So, you know, and she's, yeah. she just had a um, good performance and, and she's um, winning. Yeah, she's winning. And, um, but, but it's, you know, she's, she would be cool. Or I just kind of assume that that would be some, that would be one of the options or, I mean, I'd rather fight um, Aaron Blanchfield or Menon Fiore, like the winner of that, just because they're, you know, I think I think they're ranked a little higher. So, you know, but which but one would anybody, you rather have? Which one out of those two? Yeah, out of those two, Blanchfield and whoever Menon. wins, you know, whoever. Yeah. Thing. I mean, like Menon, obviously, like I want a rematch because, right. like, felt like I, I, you know, I was really close to beating her, and I was just just a really close fight, and I. You know, un- broke your finger. Yeah, yeah nice like, and early yeah. in the fight. It was like an accordion on my hand, so it was just gross. But you know, I but even all that aside, I still felt like I was just so close. You know, so I so that would be cool. But but if if she doesn't win, then it's like okay. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it'll be so cool. I guess, but but um, either any any one of the winners, I guess. Well, I was going to ask you about that. This weekend, it is Manon Fiore versus Erin Blanchfield. Main event, Atlantic City. I'll be jumping on a plane. I'll be there. Who, yeah. in your humble opinion, Rose, walks away the victor of that fight? Yeah, I've been saying that I've been leaning towards Erin Blanchfield. I mean, I, I do believe Manon has the ability and the power to to maybe like catch her with some sort of strike coming in. But um, but if she doesn't do that, I kind of see Erin Blanchfield sort of pushing the pace and and just outworking her. So um, that that's that's just my, my prediction. Yeah, Blan- Blanchfield's got – I'm trying to remember, Mike. We were watching a fight. Oh, it was uh, – oh, my God. Who did she maul one time? And I remember thinking, <laughs> like, nobody wants to fight her. Yeah. So it's always so crazy. Like, I don't of course, you're the person that's like, yeah, I'll fight her. Like, yeah, it's not that yeah. – the mindset <laughs> is so – it's so different because when I'm watching, I'm like, God damn, that chick is tough. You're like, yeah, yes. I'll fight that girl. That's crazy. Oh, well, that's what I want to – I want to feel it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and especially yeah. too, like for me, uh, I mean, just, yeah, her style is, I think, I think a lot of people would be maybe, you know, counting me out in that one. And that's, that's just what gets me up. You know, somebody, if, if you count me out, I'm like, all right, let's do it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. <laughs> obviously, you know, I, I have a, I have a lot of respect for her and, um, you know, I, I definitely be taking it very seriously, you know, but, uh, yeah, I think that'd be cool. Growing up, I always wanted to fight Anderson Silva simply because I idolized the guy. I had so much respect. He was just an absolute legend. Um, So for you, for the longest time ever, it was Valentina Shevchenko. She was the flyweight queen. And now we got Alexa Grasso. Two very, very close fights. Um, They're going to coach the ultimate fighter. For you, when, if and when, and we'll say when, we'll put that positive energy out there, when you get to fight for the belt, who would you rather it was against, Shevchenko or Grasso? Man, um, I guess, like, just just for my own, like, just as a, like, if if I'm just being a fan here, I think, you know, Shevchenko would be more of, like, the more, I guess, interesting or, or exciting, you know, kind of iconic fight. But um, at the same time, I also, I, I like, I like Valentina, <laughs> so you know that, <laughs> that would be a little bit hard to, you know, just on a personal level. But you know, it, it is what it is. Like we're professionals, and I know she's a martial artist. She's a she's a true martial artist. You know, the same way that I am. So I know, you know, she would have no issues with that either. But um, and I mean, we 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 punched and kicked each other, you know, <laughs> like uh, for a long time in the gym. So it's like might as well get paid for it. But yeah. Yeah, and, and Valentina is just like one of the coolest girls outside of fighting. She's got so much stuff going on. She's flying planes. She's yeah. acting in movies, and God knows what else she's doing. She's probably a secret agent for some That's country somewhere. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I want to be her. <laughs> what do you do? What What is something shocking outside of the UFC? I know you've been doing a bunch of interviews today. So, so again, thank you for your time. I can yeah. still see the scars and, and the scratches and whatnot on your face. When this all, when the dust settles, and it's just you and Pat. What do you like to do in your spare time? 
Uh, I mean, I guess right now. What makes you smile? <laughs> um, definitely. Because it ain't talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, shoot, I, I, uh, obviously like gardening, you know, that's the, the, any type of homesteading, like I'm, I'm just getting into, um, to beekeeping now. So that's like a really cool new hobby of mine. I mean, I just like just starting it. So, um, so that's very interesting. And then, um, you know, just, just, just hanging out with my dogs and my, you know, my family and friends. And, um, I've, I've been practicing piano a little bit more. I don't know. I'll show y'all my, my, uh, my baby girl. Oh, there oh we look go. at that. Like, can you see it? I don't know. Yeah, no, because we saw it a second ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah look at that. So, I don't have like the, the skills to get the, the camera going here. Are you getting some <laughs> lessons? What's that? Some piano lessons? Yeah. Um, I've been playing piano since I was like five years old. So. Oh, oh wow. And she's uh -oh. hung up on it. She's like, that's it. That's all you get it. I don't blame her. So the baby she's grand messing with out. She's got the baby grand piano. Uh, we have a piano at our house. And my one of my daughters took oh, yeah. lessons. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so loud. All the like, ding, yeah. ding, 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 ding. Lucas wanted years old, a drum play. set. <laughs> Lucas wanted a drum set. And uh, <laughs> I was like, no chance. But we got him. Uh, hey, sorry. Oh, and there we go. No, you're good. You're good. I, I knew you'd come back. In the, yeah. You were messing with the camera and you hung up on us. Yeah. I forgot where we were then. That's what I don't do on my free time. I don't do anything with my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Good. How does one start keeping bees? Because I'll tell you what. My that wife was going to be my next question. Yeah. My wife wants to start keeping bees, and I'm yeah. all for it. Okay? Hobbies are great, but I'm terrified of bees and wasps. I, I'm yeah. a baby. No, it, and that's understandable. And Well, first of all, you got to make sure you're not allergic. That's very serious. Um, and then two – uh you know there's there's um i i'm i just looked up a that there's like a mentorship program so you just like like people that are experts they kind of like set one up in your yard and then they kind of go walk you through the whole thing um there's ways you can there's so much internet uh, information available it's just like hard to like kind of decipher what's like you know like because there's Good. ways to do it right so um but i'm actually gonna do it like the legit way and get like a, a mentor and like just you know uh or like an internship program kind of a thing and and they're gonna set it up and i had one um i had a box this last season but it and it produced some uh honey but uh over the winter it, it died so um so yeah i still have oh, I have a lot to learn, but, um, but yeah, it's cool. It's, it's funny because, um, it's funny because like, you know, if you're, if you're calm and if they're not like pissing them off, like they're, they're, they're cool with you and they're, they're actually just, you know, pretty friendly. It's just, if you literally going, ah, ah, <laughs> then, yeah. they won't be freaking out. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know, they're, they're like sentient beings. It's crazy. Like I've had, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, really long story, but I've, I've definitely had like certain experiences that like, I, I feel like they're way more intelligent than we would even realize. And so they're, they're really in tune with stuff. So I, that's why I, I was, I, I feel like it's just, I've been, been called to do it, you know? So, so um really looking forward to just kind of learning more about it. And, um and yeah, they're, they're, they're chilling, you know, like they're, they're, as long as you're chilling, they're chilling. <laughs> what do you, what do you uh like? I think that you and Pat are like, they're, you're so fascinated because your personalities are so different. Yeah. I, where do you guys come up with like, and like who comes up with the beekeeping idea? Is that you or is that like Pat? Yeah, it's definitely me, you know, but it's funny. <laughs> It's funny because like um, if it wasn't for me, like he would have never, never did any of this stuff, you know, but uh, right. but it's funny because like the more and more that we, we do more like the homesteading stuff and kind of just like learning different things and hobbies. It's like he ends up picking it up more than myself and he gets more into it than me sometimes. And I'm just like I'm tired from practice or just don't feel like. You know, water. He's, he's out there beekeeping. <laughs> he's just over there like, come on, we got to get the garden ready. And I'm like, this is awesome. Because then, yeah, uh, he, he picks is. up the slack where I'm, where I'm lazy sometimes. 
And, and this pa- is what I like to talk to people to, uh, to, to people about because it's just the normal stuff away from fight. You don't want to talk about training and like. Yeah. So tell me to break down this fight. You know what I'm saying? You want to talk yeah. about this normal stuff, this everyday stuff, life. Anthony, what were we going to ask there, buddy? Oh, it wasn't actually a question. It, like Pat was one of the like I don't know, long long time ago. I remember it's like I say to you guys are totally like different personalities, but like really we get really deep into a conversation with Pat. It's not really that far off to be honest. Yeah. It was like the first big name fighter to like acknowledge me like i was kind of the undercard uh, guy like the loser you know and yeah. like i remember him just like hey what do you do and i was like oh, i'm trying not to get beat up on this bus with all these <laughs> monsters here actually <laughs> and yeah. we just like had a super cool conversation it's always been super nice even when i was absolutely so nobody very, very candid and i think over time it's like you know you, you you hang out with somebody so much you you turn into each other kind of a thing you know like but you know where we're different, we definitely end up balancing each other out. I think what what makes it work is he just you know he really just wants to focus on you know making sure I'm having a good day. So it's it's cool, you know, like it's it's a it's a huge blessing, you know. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Well, listen, it's been a huge blessing having you on the show as well, Rose. We've been a big yeah. <laughs> we're big fans of your work for a long time. Uh, congratulations on the weekend. I will drop the fact that you think Aaron wins at the weekend as well, if you don't mind, on commentary. Uh, good luck with everything going forward. And again, thanks for your time. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. All, All right. the best. Rose Nama Yunus. I mean, how can you not root for that girl? It's impossible not to. She's just, I don't know, you just find yourself, anytime I've run into her, you just find yourself enjoying the time that you're just there talking because she's so real. So just, there's yeah. no fake. There's no, we were talking earlier about the fake bullshit and all. She is a that's a hundred percent Rose, a hundred percent of the time. And she does it. She's kind of an introvert, from what I understand. So that's why I said I'm very grateful for her time today because I wasn't yeah. sure whether or not to hit a rope because yeah, I don't like to bother fighters straight after a fight, you know. But she got the win. She got back in the winning column after losing the last two. She was very open about those thoughts, and I thought I'd reach out because we've had some nice communication in the past, and she was brilliant. And to pull the curtain back, we just stopped for a quick pee break. I ran to the bathroom. I said, "Babe." Rose is doing bees. She's raising bees. And like, oh, my God. I want to do that. She's like, yeah, but she lives on a farm. She lives somewhere where land is way cheaper than California, okay? Right. So we're going to move. We're going to raise bees. We're going to have – we're going to we're going to grow tomatoes, spinach. Yeah. I See, I, I like the farming thing. I'm not big into the plants, though. That's all Rebecca I like growing the animals. We're going to have like chickens. animal thing. Animal thing. Ducks, you gotta get some shit. ducks or some some geeses. Well, uh, geese are annoying. No, not like those kind of. There's different kinds of geese. There's, well, what kind there's of geese are you talking geese. about? There's like I'm not talking about the ones in the park that hiss at you and are all <clears throat> dick, dickheads. Yeah, there's nice geese out there. Is there? We'll get some good geese then. We'll get some good geese. Um, right. So what are we talking about? Oh, we were talking about Sean Strickland. Versus mm-hmm. maybe Hamza Chimiev and Robert Whittaker calling out uh, Sean Strickland as well. I think that's a great call out for Robert. It's a good path. It could potentially be a really big win for him. Uh, but then also there seems to be a rumor going around on social media of Hamza versus Sean in Saudi Arabia. Granted, at the same time I saw that post, I also saw a post about Paddy Pimblett fighting Paul Felder. Did you see that mm-hmm. one? Oh, that would be awesome. So that I text awesome. I text Paul, Paul Felder straight away. Paul said, that's bullshit. He said, I don't know uh, why that's doing the rounds, but that is absolute horse shit. So when you guys again, you guys at home know that's true because if Mike had texted him and Paul said yes, he wouldn't have said anything to you. About we it. wouldn't be talking about <laughs> we it. Right be talking now. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it just goes to show you can't believe everything that you read on social media. Uh, but Hamzat versus Sean in Saudi Arabia, that could be another one of them. But what's your thoughts on that? I'd rather see Hamza versus Whitaker. I, I Hamza versus Whitaker. I, I, that, I'd rather see that fight. What about Sean versus Whitaker? I would love that. I, I, that's a more interesting fight for me than Strickland versus. Because listen, I'm not. This is not me negatively talking about Strickland, but we know his game plan and we kind of know where he's at. Hamza is such a dominant physical problem for a guy that has the style and it, it, it matchups make fights, right? Styles, styles make fights. 
I think that Whitaker Strickland is a great fight. I think that Whitaker Hamza is a great fight. I think Strickland Hamza is is tough. I think it could potentially look a lot like the Kevin Holland Hamza fight. Strickland fights very upright. He's a little bit limited in his mobility. He's got pretty good takedown defense, but not a huge kicking game. He's not crazy, super one punch, powerful type of striker. He's more of a you know a, a volume guy, and he's great at all of those things. It just I think stylistically, I think Hamza would get a hold of him and really slow that down, and and it may not be the most exciting fight in the world. Mm. That said, I think if you go Strickland Whitaker Whitaker Hamza, I think that those are amazing exciting fights i think regardless of who they actually end up fighting yeah. outside of drickis and izzy the next three biggest names are sean hamza and right. whitaker yeah. you someone's know what i mean luck. so yeah someone's getting so left out one of those matchups is going to get made i'd be very yeah. very surprised if they don't so i guess we'll see how it all yeah. plays out UFC 301, Anthony, you're going to be on that card. I was on the uh, the fight card no, a second Jose ago. Jose Aldo. I Jose per- Aldo is back. I've never fought on a card with Jose Aldo before. Oh, that's cool. And I think that's... Who else I, is on there? Steve Erzeg yeah. versus... Pantoja, Pantoja and Erzeg. I know that people are upset about this. Or even... I'm here in Denver at Factory X. Mark Montoya and Brandon Royville are absolutely livid that they didn't get... <laughs> that he went, he went all the way to Mexico... To f- his whole plan, well, I'm going to go to Mexico and beat Moreno, and then I'll get the next title shot because I'll beat the number one contender. I get it, the timing, and they, it's hard to go back to back like that. And it wasn't. He's lost twice though to Pantoja, right? Yeah. It's worth it, mentioning. To be it fair, is, it is, it is, and 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 they they're they're aware. You know what I mean? Like they're. They, they I asked Roy up. Val to come on the show, and he never even responded. You don't get title fights if you don't come on BYM. Yeah, you have to go on BYM. I, you know what? I hope I see him tomorrow. I'm going to give him shit about it, but give him they, they, from me. You know, um, but even Mark was, he was like, I get it. But Ursig, I said this when Ursig just fought. Um, when he knocked we, out Matt Schnell. Matt Schnell. I was working that card and afterwards I was sitting next to Dean and said, Ursig might beat them all. He's pretty really? goddamn good. He's pretty yeah. good. I was really impressed. He he doesn't have that many fights, so I get why a lot of the, the 125ers are pissed because he only has like three fights in the UFC. But... <laughs> I mean, he came in on like seven days notice and knocked off the number eight dude and then fought again and then just knocked out another top 10 guy. Like, he's pretty goddamn good. If he can keep Pantoja off his back, he might beat him. He might go all the way to Brazil and beat him. Well, Roy Val's not the only one who was annoyed. Mohamed McIve was campaigning for that fight as well. Yeah. I guess when you go out and you flatline somebody, because Matt Schnell, granted, not a superstar, but if you follow this sport, Matt Schnell has been around a long time. He's highly mm-hmm. skilled. He can compete with the best, and he yeah. can flatline. You know what yeah. I mean? Ursig, yeah, not the biggest name, but you but said that. Dean said that. He's, he's knocking nasty. out Matt Schnell's. He's yeah, nasty. He's, good. he's nasty. And he's I'll pretty good all though, around. Anybody, good luck against Pantoja, though, because that man is a monster. A monster. He's fun too, like just to talk to when we had him on. Like he's yep. a, a good conversation. He's a really fun guy to talk to. I the Makayev thing, I get I I get why they would probably pass on. I like and I like Makayev. I think he's amazing. But I mean we kind of want some excitement too. You gotta get you gotta get finishes, he's not, sadly. He's not getting finishes. He's not getting finishes. Pantoja likes to grapple, Makayev likes to grapple. It's it's tough. We got Paul Krieg versus Kao Borheo. I love that, that fight. Card as well, mate. That's yeah. a good one. Jack Shaw, Joe Anderson, Brito, Anthony Smith, Vito Petrino. Let's Stand go. up. That's Arkansas. a pretty good card. That's a pretty it's a God good card. That's a pretty good card. So it's it's a sneaky good card. So let's talk about this. Do you know anything about this? And I don't know if this is true or not. Once again, the internet has spoken, but apparently there's a clause in the contract of Alex Pereira that if he makes short work of Jamal Hill, then he gets to turn it around quickly and fight Magomed Ankalaev at UFC 301. Harrington, did we speak about this on Thursday? Yes, we did. We did. Okay, we'll keep it short. It's a bad idea. I agree. It's a bad idea. Thank you we for just, saying we, that. We ju- well, for a couple of reasons. We just talked about this looking ahead thing, taking your eye off the ball that's in front of you. Yep. I think that's a bad idea. Nobody 
make short work of Jamal Hill. Say what you want about Jamal. Say what you want about his skill set. Nobody's made short work of him. He's he's mm. in it for the long. If you even if you beat him, it's gonna hurt, and you're gonna be banged yeah. up. And then you want to turn around that quick and fight on Goliath? A completely different stylistic a, matchup. A, a awful stylistic a bad, matchup. Bad yeah. matchup. Yeah. Yeah. Like totally opposite from what you just did, but also probably the worst matchup possible in the not just at 205. Ankh Life would be a worse matchup than any 85 matchup he could find. And he would be a worse matchup than most of the guys at heavyweight since he's been talking to going to heavyweight. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, I'm just <laughs> like looking at the rankings. He might be the worst matchup in three divisions. If Pereira does be Jamal, that's a big if, right? Mm-hmm. Because Jamal, I think people, I think people are kind of sold on the hype of Alex Pereira because what he's done is incredible. Beating yeah. four champions in seven fights. Unbelievable. Two weight division mm-hmm. champion. Sensational in a short amount of time. But you can't overlook Jamal Hill. Right. Look no. at how, look at how he knocked out Johnny Walker. Right. Yeah. That's real punching power. You got Yuri. Okay, he's beating Yuri. Yan, he's beating Yan. But then you got Magomed Ankalaev, that just stands out as kind of like an anomaly in the light heavyweight division now. Because hey, all right, fair enough. He's Dagestani. He's got the wrestling, but he's also got the striking to go with it. Magomed Ankalaev mm-hmm. is a bad matchup for anybody, let he's alone a- somebody. That is a quote unquote kickboxer. He's a he's a nightmare on his feet. He's a he's a mobility wise, like he just he moves in and out of like range and really small movements. He's just out of the way. He's got a really and shitty enough for Pereira. He's a southpaw. And Uncle Life. So not only is he a different style, he's a completely different stance. And Uncle Life has a really active lead hand. He really makes it a big pain in the ass. Like it's hard to get past it because you're in opposite stances. So he's constantly touching it which is Pereira's main punch. Like he sets everything up kind of off of that leg kick and the left hook. It's opposite stances. So the leg kick is essentially a lot less effective. And the left hook is going to be nullified a little bit because he's going to be touching it the whole time and constantly with it. And he's a fire wrestler. Like I'm a pretty good grappler. And I could tell right away when he was on top, like, Ooh, yeah, this is a problem. Like he's just going to be, he's going to be hard to submit. He's going to be hard to, I had a broken ankle, so I couldn't get up. I felt like I could have gotten up had I had two legs, but like he wasn't, he wasn't going to be able to sweep him. God, you know what I mean? Again, Anthony. So what? You had a broken yeah, ankle. So- we're going to talk. We're, we've been on here for an hour and a half or ish. The only thing that's going to come out is going to be me talking about having a broken ankle and not being able to stand up. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it's not going right. to one Thug Rose quote. Not one conversation about anything positive we've said. It's going to be one excuse that I made. Well, you're making a lot of them, bro. Yeah, listen, Conor McGregor had a broken leg. Okay, right. yeah, he's got what a titanium shin bone. <laughs> well, uh, what was the break, Anthony? What was the break? Uh, 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 so that's crazy. That's the point. That's crazy. you're you're headed off back down to Brazil, Anthony. You love fighting down there. You know, you want you want to know the truth. Go on. I don't want to retire someday. Whenever I do retire a couple years from now and say I never got a win in Brazil. Why? I've never won in Brazil. How many times never. you fought there? Just twice. Oh, that's not too bad. How many times did I fight in Brazil? Was it once or twice? I definitely got head kicked into oblivion of Vitor. Yeah. Probably just once, maybe. I never got a bloody win in Brazil. Why are you trying to outdo me? Not everybody can get a win in Brazil. But I, but I want one. I want to go to Brazil and I want to leave there with a win. So so regardless, when it's all said and done, you say, well, listen, Bispin, you might have won the belt. You maybe you won you the never belt. got a win in Brazil, did you? you never won in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get all... something. If you get the title, I got to get something. <laughs> you think you're all that, you the, but you could have You got the title and the, and the jacket, the plaque in the background. Oh, I, get, I can get the goddamn country, can I? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by FitBod, which is the smart workout app that really is all you need if you want to get a good workout. Look, listen, you go to the gym, you plateau, you get bored, you do the same stuff, you're sick of doing it all. Well, guess what? You need a new workout. You need 
need a workout that is tailored to your needs, is designed for you, okay, and you want a workout that's going to push you to the next level. Well, that's exactly what FitBod provides. It creates a personalized workout routine based on your goals, your fitness levels, and the available equipment. It adapts as you improve, so each workout will be challenging and remain challenging and push you to make progress. FitBod will also track your muscle recovery, so you avoid burnout and maintain momentum. It is fine-tuned by experienced, certified personal trainers to bring the best practices and exercise science to you. And of course, you can learn all the new movements the correct way because they have over one thousand high definition demonstration videos and if that wasn't good enough okay you can get a full year's access to fitbod for less than the cost of one session with a personal trainer so give it a go today all you're going to do is go to fitbod.me slash believe you can try the app out for free it won't cost you a penny try it out for free at fitbod.me slash believe and then you can also get 25 percent of your subscription when you go to fitbod.me try the app out for free and then get 25 percent off the subscription by going to fitbod.me slash believe uh, a minute before a moment ago you spoke about nightmare matchups mm-hmm. which had we not have continued for a little while would have been a perfect segue into from one nightmare to another and i'm speaking about diego Nightmare Sanchez. A good segue. You know, um, Joshua Fabia, this absolute prick, this absolute scumbag. Fighters, this is going to shock a lot of people. Fighters are very, very easy to manipulate. Not all of us. We're not all to the same level. You know, maybe they didn't have a father figure around or whatever, but when somebody comes along, and they really pretend that they care about you and they've got your best interests at heart and they're a good salesman, they're a good con man, they can really get their hooks in. And that is exactly what Joshua Fabia did to Diego Sanchez. Now, Jesse on Fire, who's hosted this show a couple of times as a YouTube channel, he's been covering this a lot. I don't have the actual details to hand, but I did see a bit of a video that he posted where Fabia was essentially blackmailing him. He wanted a, Diego wrote him a check for $100,000, but Harrington, maybe you can just paint out the A to Z of it all for people to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, yeah, so Diego did open up a bit about it. Uh, he talked about you having Fabia in his life. Uh, he said that, you know, once Fabia got a look at his finances and saw that, you know, there might not be as much money in there as, as Fabia thought, uh, he started to become very hostile. Uh, he was issuing threats. Uh, the quote here, everybody wants to tell me, why didn't you just snap his neck? Why didn't you just crush the guy? If I was you, I would have just snapped him. Yeah, I would have loved to do that, but I'm dealing with a very unstable, mentally unstable, sociopathic psychopath that is basically the best way I could put it. You're dealing with a Charlie Manson type of mind where he's gone so far that it makes him unstable and dangerous. Uh, he went on to talk about how he claimed he was an ex-trained killer, ex-hitman, ex-contract worker for the cartels. And Sanchez says that he feared for the life of not only uh, him, uh, but his child and his uh, the mother of his child. <sighs> Do you remember that video that came out when he went into that fighter meeting and started like... Where Paul Felder kind of confronted him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would, I would, I would love to have like been in that room and just beat the shit out of that guy. Because like, do you, if anybody is going to be able to be, and and I mean this, if Diego sees this, I mean this with the most respect. There's some people that you know, like that guy could be manipulated because he just is so trusting, and that's Diego Sanchez. Like he took the one person that was clearly had the ability to manipulate, you know what I mean? And it just, uh, I remember when I had, I interviewed him just by myself and I, I just happened to catch him like the one time in like a year or a year and a half that he wasn't with Fabia. I just happened to catch him when I asked him if he, if he would do an interview with me and he made me promise that I put it out and you know, and he, he kind of went off the rails a little bit. You could tell that's when he was at his most vulnerable when he was at his most damaged at that point with Fabia. And that was kind of right before the beginning of the end. But like, I remember just feeling so sad 
for, I've actually never told, I don't know. I've ever told this story when I interviewed him, it was about 40 minutes or 45 minutes of him just kind of losing his shit. And he, he made some really, it's still out there on YouTube, but he made some crazy claims that the UFC was trying to kill him. And, and he had all this dirt on Dana and I called Dana first and said, I just interviewed Diego and he went off the rails. He's, he's lost it. And this Fabia guy has got his brain so twisted and Dana to his credit, it was one of the, in the coolest conversations I've ever had. He said, you know, you made it, you made a promise, like put it, put it out there. And when this Fabia guy leaves Diego penniless and broken, I'll be there to pick him back up. So like Diego's always good with me. He can say whatever he wants. When this Fabia guy's done with him, I'll be there to, to, to pick Diego back up. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. That was two years ago. And I don't even need to pick you back on that because I've said so many times and people just call me an arse licker and a company man, but that's the side of Dana White that people don't see. That they don't see. And even even though, and we don't need to do it, but even though we constantly tell these kind of behind the scenes stories, Mm -hmm. people aren't interested in that. They only want to hear negativity. They don't want to hear that's us trying to keep our jobs. That's us trying to uh, make money and all the rest of it. Or how about for one second, being telling the, truth and telling the shit that you really see not the shit that they see on social media or these right. horror stories and all the rest of it so like, shut the fuck up okay well, when they write because, a story about this episode they're not going to put that story in there that's just no. the simple fact they're not going to put that Smith in there blames, blames magomed ankle i have lost on broken ankle <laughs> right it's not going to be that diego sanchez was losing his mind because he was being manipulated by this piece of shit fabia and then said the most inflammatory things about his boss. And his boss's reaction was, I love Diego. When this guy's done breaking him, I'll come back in and I'll help fix it. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. Literally right now, Dana is standing behind Diego trying to help him. Right now, he's trying to help him. Like get it back on his feet. And no one sees it. In what sense? I, I think he's got some lawyer shit going on. They just helping Diego out with and, and just trying to keep food on his table. Like, yeah. like, and no one else, the, no, I'm the only one saying it. Like Diego will say it, but like, I'm the only one, I'm the only one that's saying that, you know what I mean? That's not in the stories and the clicks and all the other, again, like you, I'm going off on a tangent now, so I'll get back to the point, but no, it's fine. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's like you said, that's the shit that nobody sees and they always do. They're like, Oh, as these guys are, company shills and you know like i don't have to try to keep my job as long as i keep doing my the actual yes. job itself correctly well like dana's not gonna keep me if i'm it up as long as i do my job right. correctly I, I don't have to say nice things about dana in the ufc i just have to do my job correctly and i'm gonna keep my job <laughs> like, thank I don't, you for saying that. I don't, thank you I don't know that. why that's so hard anytime, to understand. Anytime we say things like this, it always turns into that. And you're absolutely right. I feel like I'm pretty goddamn good at my job. Yeah, I'm pretty and that's good why job. they have me there. And as long as I continue to do a good job, I will have I don't need, and I guarantee you, it doesn't get seen. Do you know what I mean? It's me mm-hmm. saying these positive things, those positive things are my experience. You know, like I'll see Dana treating people at the apex or speaking to somebody or speak to some people that, for want of a better expression, are maybe insignificant to his life. But I see Mm -hmm. how he treats them. Do you know what I mean? And that is impressive to me because it's all well and good. It's like there's an old cliche, you know, an old saying like, don't judge someone on how they treat you. Treat uh, Judge them on how they treat a waiter in a restaurant. Do you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because, you know, you know, um, because Diego Sanchez, let's get it back on track. Diego, um, I think it's fair to say he had a bit of a breakdown, right? And I think the final mm-hmm. straw kind of came in this all when when Joshua Fabio was requesting, and I don't know the full details, the medical records of Diego because they were trying mm-hmm. to somehow build a case where they could sue the UFC. Right. On letting him fight whilst he had CTE or something like that. And they're like, well, hold on a minute. If you're even thinking about that, then he cannot fight. So if essentially, he, this Fabio dickhead, this piece of garbage that was just trying to use him and take it for every last penny that he could and manipulate him was just 
you know, and use him as a door to sue the UFC just for his own financial mm-hmm. gain. Because the end of a legendary career, a Hall of Fame worthy career, he's already in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the, the original fighters, the man that won season one of the Ultimate Fighter. Crazy. And and then has no problem. I've seen this video online where he's just berating Diego, speaking down to him like he's a, a like a naughty child, where it, it, where a teacher doesn't like the student and you're talking to them like shit, or like a sergeant mm-hmm. major or a drill sergeant would speak to a maggot that just joined the army. That's right. how he's talking to him, and the whole time. And Diego writes him a check for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You know what I mean? What kind of number? The video is terrible. What kind of number have you done on this guy for him to do that? Because make no mistake, Diego could beat the living shit out of this guy. And he ain't no special forces dickhead. He ain't no uh, um, contract killer for the cartel. He's he's a prick that runs the school of self-awareness and hangs Diego upside down and kicks him in the head whilst filming it. He came into that fighter meeting in Abu Dhabi and he wanted everything to be about him. And the questions weren't about him. So he starts kicking off and Felder loses mm-hmm. his mind every single time. Remember the video of Matt Serra? Matt Serra started yeah. him as well. Yeah. Matt Serra didn't take no shit. He put him right in his place. That yeah. guy. Well, because most of us can, sn- can sniff out uh, a con man pretty quick. But like I said, the one person in our community that might you might be able to get over on is Diego. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. It's just, let's just not pretend like Diego's not unique. He's just, yeah. a, he's different than the rest of us. And that's okay. That's why he loved find any, find any fighter in the UFC that past opponent uh, of Diego or not, that doesn't love him. Everybody, nobody has no problems with Diego. He, he, that's just who he is. We all accept him. He's unique and we love him for it. And that's, but that's what's going That's the problem that Fabio's going to run into. Like now the whole world knows what you did to him. Yeah. Well, sadly, probably gonna sadly, get that shit beat out of you. I, I don't know. Sadly, we live in a world where people can just disappear because he's not really embedded into the UFC at mixed martial arts community and culture. He's just not, he was just an outsider that managed to just worm his way in. And every now and again, we see that. And I've had people do it to me. Diego had it done to him. You know, there's some, there's some nasty, disgusting, deplorable people out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's always the ones that come into your life and seem like they're doing the best things for you. The ones that are always Mm -hmm. selling themselves. Why are you selling yourself so much? If anyone's selling themselves to you, saying they can do all these things, then you've got to ask the question, well, what are they getting out of it? Because most of the time, it's not because they're just a good person. What do they really want? You know what I mean? There's always an angle. And typically it's your money. (laughs) Typically, it's your money. (laughs) It is, because it's a sad state of affairs. Money is the root of all evil. It bloody is. Amen. It really is. Anyway, so unless Harrington has got an absolute genius of a breaking story for us, which I find very hard to believe, the genius part, I find it hard to believe that he'll even respond. I'm I'm furious. Furiously googling uh, any breaking news, and I'm I'm not uh, yeah I'm, I'm not seeing any. Yeah, we'll get off the screen. I was asking, unless I didn't ask you to appear. Uh, just kidding, Harrington. Of course, uh, that does lead. You might as well come back on if you have a question. Send yeah. it to bynpod at gmail.com. Lately, we've been getting a lot of questions that are non MMA. Please, love that. We prefer those questions. We want to talk about life. I'm 45. Anthony's pushing 45 we've got ups we've got downs we've got homeless people with headphones we've got the voice of god in the background between the four of us we can give you some good advice we can tell you about some things so don't just ask if there was any dream matchup you could have had who was it that's a shit question well if you can match anyone in the pound for pound list against each other if you've got a good question send it in Oh, God, is that one of them, Brian? I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten the question, can you make me a list of your favorite whatever or the best or, like, who would win if these guys fought? Stop it. Everybody just stop it. You should definitely send in more who, name the three people you like to have dinner with, living or dead. We love that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) By the way, by the way, Anthony, uh, Pat Barry, 
just texted me. I just looked at my phone quickly. He says, but I, I was just I know, reading it. <laughs> I know <laughs> our heads are loopy know. after years of this shit, but I swear I remember that story that Anthony told Rhodes. Which one? About when you were t- when you first met Pat Barry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he just texted me too. And uh, Harry, do you remember what you're supposed to say now? I do. I remember that if uh, you are subscribing to Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, make sure you're, well, if you're listening or on Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, make sure you subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating, positive review. It really helps out on those platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and you hit that notification bell to find out whenever a new video drops. And if you want to catch over 500 episodes you can't find anywhere else, completely ad-free and totally uncensored, head to gasdigital.com. Use the promo code BYM14. Get a two-week free trial. and Check out which running great shows on the network. It's two demerits for that flub, Harrington. I was going to say it wasn't the best delivery, but we'll allow it. I wasn't going to say anything, but Brian jumped to my rescue. Uh, So today our first question is from my favorite questioner to look at, uh, Deja. Hey, guys. Um, All right. Quick fire question. Zhang Weili, Rose Nama Yunus, and Joanna. I don't know how to say her last name. Mary F*** Hill. So I had a question about... um, date ideas you know something that's outdoors um i saw something for like wine tasting and atv driving and i want to take myself out on a solo date because i ain't got nobody so i was wondering if you guys have ever just gone out on a solo adventure what have you done or have you yet to do one but you really want to so let me know peace Mm. well i'll say this deja if you leave your Instagram name on there, you're going to be inundated with a lot of offers from the believers. <laughs> I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we can find someone to take you out, Deja. I'm just throwing it out there. It's me. I'm um, the guy that, that yeah, we can yeah, find. Right. Brian's like, no, no, we have, we have the guy. It's we me. have the it's guy. Me. It's me. Yeah, Brian's editing this out so nobody gets to uh, <laughs> advance. Um, solo dates. What do you like to do if you want to get out there? You want to disconnect from everything and just be by yourself. What do you like to do? And I'm trying to think of something. Um. Well, when I'm here in Colorado, I spend a lot of time by myself so uh sometimes i'll get bored and just drive up to the mountains and just walk around you know like i'm not a big hiker or trail person but i'm just going out and checking out some super cool stuff now nature is Mm -hmm. fun um there's this new thing we've been doing me and michaela and it would probably be fun to do by yourself it's actually been a cool mingling thing um it's called farm to table there's like some of these uh like a lot of pumpkin patches like they're attached to a family and have all this land well if they're not growing pumpkins for like the fall season they got to find ways to like make money so they do this farm to table thing where everything that's at the meal they sell these tickets they'll sell like 30 tickets or something and they everything that is at the meal is something that's farmed grown harvested like from that farm and then they sell these tickets they're kind of expensive but um and not like i'm not saying they're like thousands of dollars a piece but i mean like one ticket might be 200 bucks but and everything is from that family farm and you learn about it. You go on a little rat ride around the farm, check it out, eat some amazing food. But I have seen like single people there too. Mm-hmm. Like they just checked it out on their own, but it's something me and Michaela do as often as we no, can. That sounds lovely. Actually. I'm going to check that out because that's yeah, right. On street. And thank you, Deja for the question. Um, I was trying to think about myself. I'm so busy. I don't really get much time to myself, but I do enjoy it. I do enjoy being alone. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like uh, Rebecca or, or Ellie, my daughter, will often say, oh, look at that person in the restaurant by themselves. I feel sorry for them. I'm like, don't. They're no. having a great time. You know yes, what I mean? No. They're, they're, uh, unless yeah. they're not, unless they're sad and lonely and depressed and, you know, they just cry themselves to sleep wanting a wife every night. Uh, but we don't think you're having that problem, Deja. Uh, for me, one thing that I do solo a lot, and I just started doing it again, running. I was doing the Peloton for a long time. I've got back mm-hmm. into the running. The weather's nice again. I love to just get outside and go for a run. But I'm going down to Columbia soon. I'm going down to Bioaccelerator to get some stem cells. Ooh, and I'm going to be there go. for about eight days. Uh, and I'm looking forward to just disconnecting from everything. Obviously, I've got some medical stuff to do. But mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to take some personal time to just float around Columbia and, yeah. and just be by myself. And just I was enjoy. I was supposed to go there with Weidman and oh, it was really? kind of yeah it just didn't work I mean it's hard to I mean you get it it's hard to disappear mm-hmm. and just take some personal time for eight days I mean it sounds like it should be easy but it's really not um, but 
I was kind of looking forward to the same thing, like just being there and really having nothing to do other than, you know, the medical procedures. But yeah, other than that, you had nothing to, you have nothing to do. You can kind of just check out a new place and like, not like you have a call time or you got more research or whatever. I, I love exp- uh, exploring new places, you know, mm-hmm. and again, this sounds like a prick when I say, but this is why I'm bringing it up because I've, I'm a family man. I've got three children and a wife, so I don't go on vacations by myself, right. but I'm lucky enough to have done some acting projects that have taken me all over the world. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And when I was in South Africa or when I was in Thailand, I've been to Thailand a bunch of times doing different projects. I, I love that because then I just go wander around like a tourist by myself. You know, when I was right. in uh, South Africa, went up Table Mountain and just 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 exploring places by myself. And it's it's yeah, I enjoy that. It's very peaceful. And I think there's a strength to it. And I think you need to have your own company. Sometimes you need to be alone with your own thoughts. You know, mm-hmm. there's always so many outside distractions and people going on and people calling you for work and Instagram and social media and emails and bullshit and children. You know, it's like sometimes it's nice to just disconnect and be yourself and just be at one with nature. Totally agree. Well, I hope she Boom, does that. Deja. And then tell us about do it that. And if uh, you want some Brian's company, number, you let us know. We've emailed. She has my number. Everybody has my number who I email. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, Yeah, whatever. You can call me whenever. Um, (laughs) Five, five, five. Yeah, right. Uh, So our next question is from Marco, who's a culprit often of just uh, sending in an email to, like, talk to us. But here is uh, actually a good question. What's up, BYM crew? Beautiful day at Miami, Florida. Miami Ultra is over. All delinquents are now gonna leave. We're gonna have a normal city and our traffic again. So, I wanted to ask you something today, guys. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Bisping, you are retired already, but uh, let's say Anthony, when you retire, if so, since you wanna stay with the company and you know Dana is looking out for the for the fighters and all that. So, if not doing commentating, right, and and, and interviews with the fighters. What is the next second best job in the UFC PI or for the UFC, which would you be interested in? So if not commentating what you do now, so when you finish fighting, if not commentating, what is the second, the most interesting or the best paid job you would be interested in working with the, with the UFC? There we go. You never talk about that. I would like to hear what else. You know, a retired athletes can work with the UFC and, uh, and uh, oh, oh. whatever. Mm. You know what the f- I want to mean. Brian, yeah, we do, <laughs> we do, we do. Kill this yeah, guy we now. Do. Peace. Kill him. Well, well, there's a number of career opportunities. Anthony's been doing it. You could become a catcher at Slap. Hell yeah. <laughs> April 12th, <laughs> bro. Let's go. <laughs> you got to be there? I'm going to go, yeah. I Let's work go. on the 13th, yeah. yeah. Me and you both, brother. I've got a busy week. I'm triple dipping that week. I'm doing TNT Sports. I'm doing ESPN. And I'm commentating slap. It's going to be a busy week. I will have a voice. Chris Lieben, you see him often ringside now, Mm -hmm. judging fights. Yeah. Mark Goddard used to be a fighter. He was a Mm -hmm. good friend of mine. I knew him from the UK scene. Refereeing, judging, catching. What else? I want Forrest Griffin's job. What does he do? He's doing like athlete development, development. And, like, and like overseeing the the PI and kind of the programs that go on there. Just seems like it'd be fun. He hangs out in the PI all day, gets to train during the day. Yeah, bosses I people. I'm sure. He, I'm sure he's got a tough job. I'm sure that what he because he travels a lot too. Like he's helping open like the the PI that's in Shanghai or the, and then the one that's in Mexico. So like he does a lot, but he, I feel like that'd be super fulfilling to like help grow the sport on the backside. Yeah. Anytime I go to the PI forest is always the guy I text. Hey, is it cool mm-hmm. if I swing by or whatever? Cause he's like one of the higher ups over there. If you will, forest is a great guy, by the way, shout out to him for me, what I really want to do. And I'm looking forward to this cause I'm just so busy with everything right now. I'm looking forward to when it all settles down a little bit, training fighters, and, you know, mm-hmm. like trying to mentor 
the next generation of young getting a small little gym, nothing fancy. When I moved to wherever it is, North Carolina or wherever the blood it Costa Rica, there was another one. Right. The other day I was lo- the other day I was looking up a uh, property to buy in Tuscany, North Italy, near the Austrian and Swiss border. <laughs> right. I found a house. Wasn't that much money, right? Oh my God, you want to see it. 60 acres of land. Right, what? It, yeah, it, it, a beautiful land. It currently has uh, vineyards creating forty thousand bottles of wine per year, but has the potential wow. to do ninety thousand of bottles of wine per year. How much was it this has worth? Olive groves where you can uh, create uh, over a thousand kilos of olive oil per year. I don't even know like, what olive grove is. It's where olive trees grow, and they turn the olives into olive oil. How much is this place? It was about eight hundred thousand. Really? Yeah, and it was. Wow. I, I, it had outbuildings. It had stables. It had a swimming pool. It had about twenty-seven bedrooms. And this was in Tuscany, Italy, and it was beautiful. Now, granted, the only issue is we've got to go and live in Italy. And I said to Babe, I was on the uh, Babe. I was said to your wife. Wa- your, your wife doesn't leave the house, anyways. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was on the toilet dropping the kids off at the pool, right? And I don't know why I started looking up houses in Tuscany. I must have seen something on Instagram or something. So I started yeah. Googling it. I was like, oh, my God. I said, Ben, never mind North Carolina. We're going here. She goes, Michael, but our kids will live in America. I'm like, fuck the kids. <laughs> Forget well, the kids. Yeah. I want to live near the, the Swiss and Austrian border and grow Mikey B's Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> You know what I mean? That sounds amazing. Who doesn't want to oh do that? Oh my gosh, this is amazing. The mountain, the mountain air. Just bring your kids with you. There's 27 bedrooms. They could be as far away from you as possible. Deja can come. Anthony can come. Harrington can come. We going. could all live there. We're all going to live The there. amount of subscribers we have, all the subscribers can come and live with us as well. You're <laughs> subscribe and hit that ring bell. <laughs> So this just made me think while you were talking about that. I saw over the weekend there is a town in Switzerland, right, in the Swiss Alps itself on the Italian border uh, that is going to pay people up to $40,000 uh, to move with them and uh, up to two children. They'll give you 20000 for the couple to move, 10000 for each kid you bring. You get forty dollars okay. instead of spending so 800 That sounds like a great deal, and I've got three kids, so basically I've got to leave one behind. <sighs> Tough call, but I'll do it. Mm. <laughs> Should we leave the show there? Because I'm sure you've got a training session to get to. I'm sure I would I love do. to do more questions, but you've got a training session, Anthony. We've got to be respectful. Are you going to blame it on me? No, I'm being respectful. All right. Yeah, I do got to get. I got. I got no, exactly. Me. No, I got not exactly. I could. I, I could shoot the shit for another half an hour, but I know you probably got to get too. out That's of it. Problem. Yeah, yeah. Big thanks to this Rose. Was, this was good. This was fun. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It, it's always good. It's always good mm-hmm. when you're on. We always have a good conversation. Yeah. Uh, Thursday's going to be hard. Yeah. It's going to be me and Harrison and some guests that I'm trying to rope in. <laughs> you, want to, you want me to talk to Brandon, Roy Bell, for you, see if we can get him on? Oh, please do. Please do. Yeah. Do I'd love to speak yeah, to Brandon, yeah. all jokes aside. Uh, sure. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you, Anthony, for being here. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you soon.